Okay, I think we are ready to start. Um, welcome everybody to this uh, online GGP Connect webinar uh, series. As you know, the GGP as a research infrastructure embarked in a new and very ambitious round of data collection last year with the theme of continuity with the previous round of data collection focus on life course family dynamics, but also with a new ambitious program of introducing some innovation, opening some new possible areas of research. So at the same time, we also launched this new GGP Connect series in order to showcase the work of our national team and also to exchange with the GGP user community. So in that spirit, we're delighted today to welcome uh, Professor Gunnar Andersson as representative of the Swedish national team. Uh, he will make a presentation for about 20 minutes, which will be followed by 20 minutes of Q&A with the audience. So please, throughout the seminar, use the Q&A function to ask your question. You can also raise your hand. And I should also mention that at the end, I will formally close this webinar, but we will also leave the space open. So if you still have burning questions, things you would like to ask to Gunnar or to the GGP, please stay and we'll be, we'll be continuing the discussion. So without taking uh, more time, again, uh, a big welcome to Gunnar and Gunnar, it's all yours. Thank you, Will. <clears throat> okay, so then I, I'm, I'm going to yeah. and then I will uh, present a, li a little bit of the <clears throat> data collection for the Swedish DGS and we are quite ex excited at uh, my, my unit because we have now finished the data collection and we are reached the goal of uh, uh, more, more than a year's hard work. Yeah. So uh, the Swedish team is uh, <coughs> constituted by myself and Johan Dahlberg and Gerda Nair. And Johan Dahlberg is the guy who has uh, perhaps worked uh, <coughs> hardest and most with all the nitty gritties in this project. And he has also helped me to put together this uh, PowerPoint presentation where we will present a little bit what we have, what we have been doing and what we have achieved. <coughs> So uh, first, uh, just a little then screen about the, the, the workflow. Yeah. So of course, this has been going on for several years with the planning, putting together the national team that was building on a previous uh, GGS team that we carried out in 2012. Uh, in our case, we have established contact with Statistics Sweden. That was this funding aid, the, the agency that carried out the previous GGS and that we have worked with also th this time. We applied for funding, secured funding. Uh, we did not do a ministry contact because that's not the kind of thing you do in a country like Sweden, but we have worked with the research councils uh, also for the infrastructure developments. And then we have worked with the, the Swedish uh, or the, the questionnaire and we have uh, adapted it to a Swedish context. And I will re return a little bit to how we did it and, and why we did it. And we have developed a few modules that, that we think are necessary to be up to date with the, the, the research questions that we want to address. And then we have been in the field, we had the combined web and postal survey and the Swedish GDS is also a linked register survey GDS. Yeah, so we have uh, re longitudinal register data added to the GDS and then in the future, in a few years time, then we We'll do a follow up and see what has happened with the different demographic outcomes in the registers of those who have responded to the GDS 2020. <clears throat> okay, so uh, as I said, uh, we participated and we carried out the GDS already in 2012 and now 2021. Uh, is not such a long time, uh, long, long time later. And in 2012, then we were actually one of the last countries to join the survey data collection. And this time uh, we were instead one of the first countries to join. So it's a totally different uh, uh, logics behind our participation. And this is the, the motivation. Yeah. So in 2012, 
uh, then we were in a situation where we could do most of our research with uh, the fantastic Swedish and Nordic register data, and we worked with register data, but we realized that, of course, we didn't need to be plugged in into a comparative survey program and so that Swedish data can be used in comparative research. In 2020, then our motivation was really uh, that we need the survey data for research uh, on demographic developments that we cannot cover by uh, other types of data with registered data and the, the fertility developments that cannot be explained by uh, structural factors that we can find in the register, so we need to have data on those on subjective dimensions. <clears throat> um, so, and that led to us uh, making a little bit of adaptations to the Swedish GDS. We were not encouraged to do this by, by, the, by the team in Holland, but uh, but we, we still thought that we ha had to do this, yeah. So we did some shortenings of the standard questionnaire. We removed questions that we thought were of tangential interest. And this we could do because we already have the 2012 version available. So those of you who are interested in those questions that we did not cover this time, you can use the 2012 version and you will have all this data available there. And we thought we didn't have to repeat everything this time. Uh, and then we also had a shorter age range. So now we focus on reproductive ages, 18 to 59. And that means that some of the questions that were more about relations to elderly generations uh, could be cut out. <clears throat> so that's how we did. Uh, and then uh, instead we added a few new modules that we thought are uh, particularly uh, important to uh, add when we want to uh, study the ongoing fertility declines in the Nordic countries and, and in Sweden. And particularly, we have worked on uh, developing a module on perceived uncertainties and lack of trust that we think can be some of the factors that contribute to, to fertility decline, since we have shown that it's not related to structural hardcore factors. Uh, and of course, this was now carried out during the course of the pandemic. So then, of course, it was necessary to have a set of COVID-19 relevant questions. So we added a module on that also. And then uh, we also added a module on intensive parenting that we could think was another factor that could contribute to uh, fertility developments that we have observed in the Uh, in the last per period, let me see. <clears throat> okay, so here is a little bit then uh, uh, that Johan put together a little bit estimation of how much we have cut in the different uh, sections. So these are the different modules in, in the GDS. And it looks like we have done drastic uh, cuts, but um, in reality, it is a few of those very big batteries with a lot of similar questions. So in the fertility, a section we we cut out uh, uh, questions related to the theory of planned behavior and for those of you who are interested in those questions that most of them are available in the 2012 version uh, in the household um, section we cut out a lot of questions on who does what in terms of household work in the household and again you you can then refer to, to the old, old questionnaire if you're interested in this. And in the income section there we cut out a lot of questions on <clears throat> whether you can afford to eat chicken and wear shoes and the, the, the entire batteries where these kind of questions were that we thought were not so relevant for the Swedish context and which are available in the previous GDS. Uh, and then here we have a little bit where we have added a new uh, uh, section and here's the number of questions. So mostly in the well-being and in the attitude sections where we had done questions on trust in institution, on intensive parenting, parenting and different risk factors in, in society and the COVID questions. Uh, and on top of this, then we have also add <coughs> retrospective histories on the labor market attachments that, attachment that comes from the population registers, but that we didn't add in, in this diagram. So here just a little uh, what we did in the last year. So 2019, then we secured the funding uh, from the Riksbank and Jubileums Fund, which is the funding name of the, the agency that have uh, paid for our, our uh, 
survey participation and it is a web survey so it's not extremely expensive compared to the, the previous uh, gds that we did <clears throat> and of course the application was done in 2018 but then we started early 2020 we uh, established contact with statistics sweden as our field agency as we worked with them in the previous gds and we had very good uh, a good uh, experience uh, working with them uh, and then we also made a, a support letter to the S3 uh, uh, ap applications of the GGB team for the, the on the European level Swedish support letter. We worked with the uh, translations of the different English and, and Swedish uh, questionnaires uh, with questions from previous and from new uh, survey items that are available in both languages and shortening the, the survey items just as I described. And then in the spring 2020, then it was with the, the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Uh, and uh, yeah, right now, the, the mood is perhaps a little bit relaxed but at that time it was quite tense and then we really had to take take uh, consideration the timing when we should put the survey into the field yeah. so because if this survey is about uncertainty things and a little bit uh, worries about the future and so on then you cannot post a survey when people are sitting at home and panicking and having maximum uncertainty. So then that means that we delayed a little bit our, our schedule of, of when to go into the field. So uh, we finalized the new uh, survey items, sometimes referred to as a Nordic module, and these uh, uncertainty survey questions, they are also available as a GGP working paper and as an optional uh, module in the standard GGP uh, program. <clears throat> Uh, during the fall in October, we got a technical report on the survey items, the questions that we post in Swedish language from Statistics Sweden with really good uh, input on the feasibility of questions and how, how you could uh, uh, formulate them, uh, in which order you can take them and so on, uh, which also led to, to uh, modifications. <clears throat> and they also thought that we had a, a far too long survey for a web version. So that made us to cut down a little bit more on, on, the, on the survey items. We had to do an application to the Swedish Ethical Review Board that was turned into a new review agency. Uh, and this agency had to show that they are necessary. So they uh, caused a lot of problems for all kinds of applications. And we were also got caught with some iterations uh, whether we could do the GDS and ask all the questions that we wanted to ask. Uh, okay, and then we did the user and service agreements with the GDP team in Dan Haag. And then we finalized the contract with Statistics Sweden, uh, which we then signed in January 2021. And at that time, we decided that we should also include an extra immigrant sample in the Swedish DDS. And that is because we had several uh, migration projects that uh, wanted to support additional samples on, on immigrants. And then we decided to do this since we got then additional in-house funding to do this. <clears throat> so here is a little bit on how the sample looked like. Yeah, so we had a non-stratified random sample uh, this time. In 2012, we had a stratified random sample, but now we decided to have a non-stratified and have the entire population as the, as the basis for the sampling. And that is done through the excellent population register of Sweden. <clears throat> uh, in 2012, we had uh, 18,000 individuals in our sample at ages 18 to 79, and we got a response rate of 54% that we were quite disappointed with. <laughs> and then uh, we were still then got the hint from Statistics Sweden that maybe we shouldn't expect more than 30% of our responses. So then we increased the sample to 30,000 uh, at ages 18 to 59 to still be sure that we get uh, enough of uh, final re respondents to, to have something to work with. And we added on the immigrant subsample uh, to, the, <coughs> to, to the, the business. And that we did by focusing on the five biggest immigrant groups uh, at the age ranges 18 to 59 in Sweden, which are, um, okay, I'll, come, I'll show that in, in the next slide. Yeah. So we continued with the revisions to the Swedish Ethical Review Agency who complained that we could not ask uh, uh, respondents questions about the partner. <clears throat> and then we had 
to tell which legal legal uh, uh, paragraphs that would make this possible. And then we found out the legal paragraphs and then we passed through the uh, ethical review board. Uh, then in January, then it got hectic. So then we also did the layout of all the postal questionnaires that were supposed to be printed and sent out to all the respondents who did not participate in the web uh, questionnaire. We finalized the English and Swedish versions for the web versions of the questionnaire. And we did a lot of testings uh, with statistics within of the web versions. And then there were a little bit different also uh, versions for immigrant and Swedish born uh, participants because of the immigrants we had to ask questions uh, about family background that for the Swedish born people we could find in the registers and we do not uh, include in the survey. In, uh, yeah, in early 2021 then it was also the last wave of the COVID pandemic and then the, the mood in society and the panic was a little bit less intense. Yeah, so it was also we also thought it was uh, uh, <coughs> relevant to, to post a, a su survey and go out with a survey and that people will some sit at home and feeling relaxed and some people have a normal lives, but that they could respond properly to, to survey on, on, on demographic careers and on uncertainties. So in February, Statistics Sweden draws the sample of respondent and we did a lot of testing. As I said, we did a missile letter and in March 2021, we went into the field. <clears throat> and then I will show here is then how the data collection pr proceeded. So here we have the number of responses coming into Statistics Sweden per day. And you can see them distributed via web uh, responses that comes in then instantaneously. And then the postal letters who are coming in and then getting scanned. And then you can see there are a little bit heapings because Statistics Sweden didn't do any scanning during the weekend. So you can see there a little, little bit. So the first uh, letter was sent out 16th of March and you can see that there was then a, a reaction. And then we sent out a reminder on the 7th of April uh, with the letter, the poster survey. And you can see that this caused an additional responses, both people who sent in the poster uh, survey, but also reaction in the web version. And then we have the third and a fourth, uh, no, a second reminder and the third reminder, a third and a fourth letter to respondents, which gave less and less input. And then we were actually done in the middle of June, but uh, in the middle of June, then it's close to midsummer and Swedish government agencies then go out on celebrating on the countryside. And after that, they pull down the curtain and go on vacation. So we, we kept the survey open until August. And then when they came back from the, the forest, then we could close the survey uh, with just a few more, more re responses. And then we have now received also then all the re re survey responses. So here it is, the response rate is half as much as what we had last time when we were, were quite disappointed and now it's 27%. So, but uh, yeah, we already know, knew from the outset that it would be something like, like this. And we, yeah, we still think that uh, uh, we need this data and then there are of course considerations, what kind of statistical uh, work you can do with this uh, analysis. But you can see here are the five biggest immigrant groups in Sweden at age range. These are foreign born people from Iraq, Iran, Poland, Syria and former Yugoslavia. And there you see that <coughs> the response rates are even lower. So for those who have been in Sweden quite some time, it's about half as much as for the Swedish born and for the most newly arrived groups from Iraq and Syria, it's even half of that. Yeah. And here we, Statistics Sweden has not even calculated weights and it's really a question what one can do with, with this uh, survey responses. But that is up to the, the migration researchers who have ordered to the data to uh, evaluate. So, um, those who uh, then uh, participated, you can see that the vast majority used the web version, web version, uh, and uh, about a third used the postal version when they had the opportunity or the, the choice between both of them. So the web version was the, the most, uh, most uh, prominent uh, in, in the reply. For those who use the web, we can also see what kind of web devices were used. So about two thirds used a desk or an, and a laptop. So that was a little bit more. I thought that uh, more people would use the smartphone. About a third used the smartphone. And then a few people also had a little tablet at home. <clears throat> 
Uh, and then we had the option in the web survey to have an English version. So if you didn't uh, feel comfortable with Swedish language, you could switch to an English version. Since we anyway have the documentation in English, that was quite easy, easy to implement. But very few, about 5% used uh, the, the English version to, to respond to the, to the survey. Uh, and then a little bit more on the non-response patterns because the level is not satisfactory of course it was not even satisfactory to 54 and that has been a declining trend ever since when it's declined from 90 to 80 percent response rates people were shocked and now it's down to uh, super low levels but then we can still look on on the who did and who did not res respond and here we can see that there's a very strong gradient with education so the highly educated are more than double as likely to respond to the survey as the medium educated and then uh, much lower still with those with basic uh, education. <clears throat> uh, there was no uh, differential between different parts of uh, Sweden. So it's not that the big city people were less, uh, uh, less uh, willing to participate. Uh, but as, as we already saw, there's a huge effect also of country of origin. So the Swedish born are much more likely than it's less likely to respond if you're coming from other Nordic countries, about half as much if you come from another European country, and even less if you come from uh, outside of Europe. And then we also have the, the, the age pattern that we know that the, the more elderly people are more likely to respond, except for the very youngest age groups who still live in the parental home, where probably the, the parents tell uh, the children to uh, uh, <coughs> reply to, to the survey. And then, of course, now we have cut out the oldest respondents. So that is also helps to reduce the overall uh, response rates as if we compare to uh, 2012, where there were more pensioners and the pensioners are uh, ha happy to respond. <laughs> okay, and we also have the um, gender differences. So this type of survey that is about family relations is uh, more attractive to, to, to women or women are more uh, cooperative and uh, no matter what the topic is that is a bit unclear so uh yeah i just want to compare this with the response uh, patterns to the the previous uh, uh, survey that we have in 2012 and more or less the patterns are the same the yellow bars are how it looked in 2012 uh, which is interesting so the of course the response rate is much lower but the patterns in non-response is similar they come out a little bit stronger in 2020 than in 2012, uh, of course, because the, the, the non-response uh, uh, behavior is much stronger, but otherwise it, it is similar. Uh, and the, the educational gradient, for example, it could, could be interesting because uh, in the previous version, they were uh, interviewers at Statistics Sweden to help guide the, the people through the interview. And here was in self-administered, so you could think that the the, the effect of education would, would be even stronger, but it's only a little bit stronger and it is very similar to that pattern. Okay, uh, yeah, I already said there is not so much uh, regional variation. Uh, so most regions are uh, the same and there are no big differences between the big cities, Stockholm, Göteborg, Malmö and rest of Sweden. But here are the two outliers, Gävleborg and Gotland, but still not super outliers. Uh, here is a little bit uh, distribution on the codes for the questions with non-response. So what type of questions that did not have a non-response within the survey for those who participated in the survey. So we also did a little bit another analysis of that. <clears throat> uh, and here it shows then what type of questions and the bars in green that have between 5 and 15 percent internal non-response it is uh, almost all of them are about timing of events when different demographic events occurred. So year and months of the first cohabiting union, uh, uh, year and months of the dissolution of the first cohabiting unions and this kind of things. So these are questions that have higher non-response. Non uh, the three blue bars are the only one with substance questions. So that was a little bit uh, about uh, helping child with homework. And uh, the, uh, the questions 110 and 111 is about your current activity for those who are unemployed or students. And uh, some of those might think that this question was a little bit strange, but only 5%. Uh, 
So this is a little bit overview of the wave one. Here is the blue dot. That's where we did the survey, 2021. Uh, and then uh, we have already con con collected data on economic indicators, domestic migration, demographic events prior to the survey, up to the survey. And then the green lines here are the updates that we will do in five years time when we will do a follow up on the demographic events uh, in 2016. And then we can also follow up on an, uh, economic and demographic indicators of the type that we can measure in the registers. So I'm almost reaching the end of the presentation in case Anne is starting to get nervous. <clears throat> but I just want to show here a little bit the, the distribution of the, the source of survey and register data, because one of the advantages with our survey is that we can re reduce the questionnaire by pulling out some of the information from the population registers. And this uh, is particularly the case for, of course, the dem demographic uh, histories and the demographic background. Uh, also with generations, the parent, the birth dates of parents, of the siblings, grandparents, and all these kind of things. And also a lot of the income questions where we have information on type of income in, in the different years. So and now we do a little happy end here by uh, if people are distressed about the response rates. But then Johan has done a little bit of data evaluations where we have looked on some variables that are collected from the GDS 2020. And uh, then we have the replies from the register data. And then we can see then on the questions that people replied if it confirms to what we can find in the registers. <clears throat> and this is about the, the childbearing history. So we did collect questions on the childbearing histories because there were additional questions that we don't have in the registers. And then we also have the, the childbearing histories in, in the registers. And we can then see here for women and men born in the 1962 to 77, the uh, cumulative, uh, TFR, the core TFR, ultimate fertility uh, for the different cohorts with a stable red line from the register and a little bit more shaky blue line from the, from the, the survey. And for women it's perfect, uh, uh, for perfect uh, <coughs> co coordination with the numbers. For men, the uh, response rates uh, differ slightly, but it's also more or less perfect. Childlessness uh, uh, is the same thing. So we have uh, uh, also or more or less perfect uh, uh, coordination between the, the men and women, uh, with just with some random variation from the survey data, of course. And here are ages at uh, first, second, and third birth uh, for those who gave birth in the different cohorts. Bam, ba -dum. <laughs> and then I end with this little central hub picture. So I don't know how I did with the time. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Gunnar, for this uh, for this presentation. We are, of course, we were really eager to to uh, to learn about um, what your team had been uh, doing. So. Um, let me turn to the uh, to the audience. Uh, remind them that there's different ways you can now ask a question. You can do so through the Q and A, and I can read them, or you can uh, raise your hands, and then we can um, allow you to ask your question. So we have currently close to 40 people in the audience. So who would like to uh, ask questions? Because I don't see any in the Q&A at the moment. Okay. There's a question from uh, Brianna Perilli Harris from Southampton, Gunnar, who is asking, um, do you know why so many people wanted to use the postal survey rather than just answering on the web? Yeah, well, I would uh, say why you so many people used the the web instead of using the postal survey. So, so the, the blue one are the web, and most people used the web. And then on the seventh of April. Then we send out a letter with the postal survey and then get it all on paper. And you can see that the reaction is still, it's not that all of them uh, fill in the, the, the paper version. So maybe half of them fill in the paper version and 
and uh, half of them discovered that there is a, a web version. So, and, and if I uh, would uh, start fibbling on the web, then I would probably uh, be more happy to, to have the paper version. We have a nice, nice printout. It looked look, uh, very, very uh, you have a good overview and I would uh, fill in and I would send it in, so. Thanks. Um, I'll uh, continue here about the uh, your, your postal survey, which seems to have attracted some question, uh, Gunnar. So uh -huh. there's a question here coming from Olga Maslovskaya asking, um, you mentioned that you shortened the questionnaire. How many pages actually was the paper questionnaire? Uh, it was still tons of pages. <laughs> uh, do you remember, was it? Is, uh, are you there? Uh, no, it was still, yeah, I, I can't, I don't remember, could it be 40 or so, but it was still, uh, or it was still a heavy book. And that, that is one of the comments of the survey uh, uh, unit of statistics with them that uh, this, this was far longer than they have ever seen. So, so but, but still it, it, uh, it, it, it still, uh, it is less massive on paper than, than clicking on the, the different, uh, the, the web versions, so I, 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 I had a feeling. Okay. But you, and you, can, a... you can also, if you're there, uh, or if you uh, 28 pages. 20, 28, okay, good, 28, yeah, that was the story. I, thought it, I knew it was something ending in eight. <laughs> So there's, there's now a few questions about uh, the web uh, itself. So uh, I'll take two at the same time. One comes from Isabella Buber Anser from Vienna, who is asking about the, um, the, do you have any information about the mean duration of the web survey and to which extent people would stop and return later? So that's uh, one set of questions. Another question from uh, Louisa Fadel from uh, Belgium, asking if any kind of incentives were money uh, incentives, for example, were used to, um, to uh, try to encourage people to participate in the survey. So can you take these two questions? Absolutely. So yes, uh, yes, no, the, the question is no. <laughs> Uh, so um, uh, the, the, the information on the, the, the length of, of the, the survey, start time and end the time, it was supposed to be, but, but that had been corrupted. So we don't have information on how, how long people we were spending on, on filling out the, the survey. And, and that what comes in is those who have uh, participated in the full survey. And then the last question is that you send it in. So that, that's what we have in there. But we don't have information on long pauses and, and how, how that worked, yeah. And the question on incentives, we did not use any in incentives. So there we, uh, we relied on, on the advice of Statistics Sweden that uh, was saying that uh, the incentives doesn't give any, 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 uh, any additional impact. So it's not, not worth it in, in the Swedish case, yeah. There is another big survey program where they also worried about su survey response rates, but, and then decided to go in, uh, at the late stage to give in incentives and try to pay people to, to participate in the survey. But then it's really huge incentives. So like a daily salary or something. And that was nothing that we had uh, in our budget. Or even we were even considering. Thanks. Um, there's, um, I'll again take two questions, Gunnar. One is about, you mentioned that different devices were used in different modes, but you didn't say anything about whether or not it produced massive difference uh, in terms of item non-response. So that's one question. And a bit related to that, you showed that there was high item non-response rate when it came to date question. And the question here coming from Milan boucher vella from INED asking to which extent it was a misunderstanding of how, how to enter the dates in the CAWI interface. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, so it was not a, a, a misunderstanding of how to enter the, the dates yeah, because we, we had designed the, 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 the survey and put it to the Swedish logics. If we had used the, the, the 
the, the standard law is of the GDP, but then people would have got confused. Yeah, and the people in Sweden or yeah, well, any country are used to, to make the dates in, in their own logics, and we used the, the logic. So that, that was not an issue. It's just the, the remembering if you had a tons of cohabiting relationships 20 years ago, how can you remember when this uh, <laughs> began or, or, or stopped? So it's, it was a remembering. And we don't know the differences between the devices, but that we can look a little bit more, more into. But I don't think that uh, makes any, any difference because it is, is really about remembering dates. And, and you can also see that those questions that are a little bit more, more like cohabiting unions are a little bit less remembering than, than childbirth and these kind of things where people do remember. Thanks. Um, the other question is about um, uh, completed or non-completed questionnaire. So the information you have provided today, are these people who have completed entirely the questionnaire? Or did you include some partial completion? And specific, specifically, was there any specific point in the questionnaire where you can see that there are big breakoffs? No, that we, we, we cannot yet see. So what you, I, you have in front of you right now, these are uh, people who are sending in the entire survey and then the sending in is the last question of the survey. So they have, have completed the survey and then send, they send it in. So those who gave up, somewhere and never send it in for those we don't have any data so, so it is uh, so it is not a, a stop uh, in the middle and those partial non-responses it is just a question here and there where there's some missing data but the, the respondent has still sent in the survey so you don't see the you don't see so if people fill out 50 percent of the questionnaire online you will not receive that data. Is that what you're saying? Only yeah, when they reach the very end question and then they push a submit. Yeah, yeah because the, the last question is that we agree that we can use this data and then you send it off. So then, then it comes in. Otherwise, it's, it's not covered. Okay, okay. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks for this uh, explanation. Um, there were some questions about, uh, you showed that very few people entered, uh, used the English uh, version, but there's a question about how did you actually do that? Um, could people change halfway through or, or they could, uh, did you set, send, for example, the two sets of paper questionnaire? How did you handle the, the two languages? Okay, so that was, the, the paper questionnaire was only in Swedish, yeah. but then in the missive, then we told that in the web version, you can use uh, uh, English or a Swedish version. And then uh, in the web, there you could then at the first page, uh, click if you wanted to have a, a English version instead of a Swedish version. So that was a web, web solution only. Um. Let's see. There is some question about the the the, the uh, some of the questions that were included or not. Do you have, had do you question on the personality? The big five questions were they there? That comes from no, uh, they Yeah, no, they disappeared. They, they were uh, we, we, they were in our internal work uh, until the very last stages when we had to uh, cut out a, a little bit extra. So the, the big five they, they disappeared. Okay. Um, uh, there's a question about whether or not you already know if the people who answered the postal questionnaire had different demographic characteristics than the web people. <clears throat> no, that we don't know yet. Yeah, that that we can uh, look into. Okay, good. Um, there is a question in the chat, and more to us as to whether or not we will make the recording and, and slide available. The presentation, indeed, uh, is being recorded and will be made uh, available soon on the DGP website, just like the other webinar that we're having uh, so far. So let's see, I'm uh, monitoring here. Am I forgetting um, something? Anybody who thinks that I'm forgetting a question? There's a few minutes to add something else. Yes, there's something else coming here. Um, ah, a very interesting question. Gunnar from a Hello. colleague from a colleague from Statistics Canada, uh, Pascal Beaupre. 
the question. Uh, if you had to redo right now the GDP Sweden, what would you change? No, I would, 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 I don't think I would, 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 would change anything. Of course, we would, wouldn't do the immigrants a subsample since the response rates were so extremely low. But the additional cost to do the immigrant sam samples were not so 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 huge yeah, because if we were set up the the whole system, then it only amounts to yeah sending out uh, letters with which cost a couple of dollars per, per letter. So, but still. That uh, that effort didn't uh, pay pay off given the, the super low response rates, and then during normal circumstances, I would maybe have <coughs> panicking uh, and and uh, thinking that uh, it's not worth to, to do a survey at all. But uh, as I said in the beginning, we we need a survey with subjective questions in order to to understand what is going on, and we cannot rely on on other data sources. So. But otherwise, uh, we, we, we wouldn't do things the, the differently. Good. If I can uh, ask maybe uh, one of the last uh, questions here. Uh, uh, Gunnar, you, you nicely outlined the timetable you have followed. You didn't say anything about the next step. So basically, we are curious, uh, GDP community, um, what sort of, when are you planning, to, for example, some of, the, I suspect there'll be some technical reports, uh, including some of the data quality uh, issues that you have started to explore here. So when can we as user community uh, expect to hear a bit more about the data quality? And uh, how about the data release? What's your expectation uh, here? When will you share the data with the community? Johan, you, you want to respond? Uh, I think we're aiming for by the end of the year. Uh, but uh, yeah. So yeah, we have, we're already quite, quite well on, on, on track. Yeah. So the data are in-house. And uh, yeah, we knew since we did a survey, the same people that did this kind of reports uh, only yeah, less than ten years ago. Then we we know how to do this kind of things. So so it it will be quite quite uh, standardized. So so it shouldn't take too 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 to long time. Great. Well. Thank you for that, uh, Gunnar and Johan was was also present. This is this is very uh, this is very exciting. Uh, it will add uh, at the same time it will provide really new up to date information. As I said at the beginning, also on new topics that we had not explored so far in the GGP. Uh, at the same time, it will represent some challenge for the GGP community. Uh, the issue of a uh, low response rate and understanding what really the impact is on the data. So we look forward to uh, hearing more from you. And uh, of course, for the GGP community, we'll keep you up to date as to any new technical report or new data release that will come up. But on that, a big, big thank you to Gunnar and Johan, and also to Mike from the GGP Hub for having uh, organized this. So thank you very much. And as I said, if you want to stay online, uh, please do so. We will now stop the recording, but we will keep the channel open so that if you want to continue the discussion for a few minutes with, uh, with the presenter. So on that, thank you very much. Stay tuned for our next webinar in about a month from now. <laughs>